While you're turning to Acts chapter 14, let me share with you that I am beginning a series of messages that I've entitled The Bedrock of Baptist Belief. Clearly, a growing number of Southern Baptists do not know the Baptist bedrock beliefs that we should know. In fact, many are like the man that uh, I read about that was asked what he believed. He said, I believe the same thing my church believes. (laughs) When he was asked what his church believes, he said, they believe what I believe. (laughs) Then when asked, well, what do you and your church believe? He said, we believe the same thing. In 19 and 25, Southern Baptists put together its first statement of faith called the Baptist Faith and Message. It was most recently revised in the year 2000. I'm going to draw from that statement in this series along with other sources. I'm also going to draw from Dr. Paul Powell longtime pastor in Texas, one-time president of our Southern Baptist Convention Annuity Board, which is now Guidestone. He wrote a book entitled Baptist Bedrock. I've drawn from that book, that work, for our series title, The Bedrock of Baptist Belief. I want you to know the basic doctrines of Southern Baptist life. Now we're going to begin with the eternal one, the one from whom all began, and that is God himself. Look, if you will, at our text. I've chosen the 14th chapter of Acts, beginning there with verse 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb. He had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, They raised their voices saying in their Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. When the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to make sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all things that are within who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness. In that he did, or in that he did good. Gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. I read that when Mark Twain was at the height of his career, he met dignitaries from all over the world. The story goes that one day his young daughter said to him, Daddy, if this keeps up, pretty soon you're going to know everybody in the world except God. It would be a tragedy to go through life and know a lot of people, but yet not know God. Perhaps even worse, to go through life and know a lot of people and have a distorted view 
of God. Now I realize that God is greater than our understanding. Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man on the earth in his day, wrote chapter 11 verse 5, As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts greater than your thoughts. I recognize that we cannot fully understand God and his ways. John Wesley once said, Bring me a worm that can comprehend man, and I'll show you a man that can comprehend God. In the 17th century, an English aristocrat crossed paths with a commoner, asked him where he was going, and the commoner said, I'm going to church, sir. What will you do there? asked the aristocrat. Worship God, sir. Is your God a big God or a little God? And the commoner said, he's both, sir. The aristocrat said, both? How can that be? And the commoner replied, he's so great, sir, that the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, but he's so small that he resides in my heart. That's the awesome grand truth of God. The one in whom we are trying to comprehend in our own minds and hearts. But folks, while we cannot comprehend all the ways of God, we can know God. And the more we know Him, the more we love Him. And the more we love Him, the more we want to worship him. Now we go to the text this morning. It centers around the healing of a crippled man. And when the people witnessed the miracle, they believed that Paul and Barnabas were really gods that had come down to visit the earth And they shouted out in their Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Even the local priest of Zeus got in on the action and he brought oxen and garlands to make sacrifice. Verse 13. The belief that God came down and visited the earth as men was a long-held belief of the day. And I understand that there are religions in the world today that still have that belief. In their excitement, they called Barnabas Jupiter or Zeus, which means the chief god, since he was the COO, the chief operation manager or officer of the group, and they called Paul Hermes, the god of oratory, because Paul was the chief spokesman. These people were ready to worship Paul and Barnabas. But verse 14 tells us that Paul and Barnabas ran among the people, began to tear away their clothing to show them that they were mere men, but also it was that common, instinctive Jewish way of responding toward blasphemy. Claiming Paul and Barnabas as gods was blasphemy. So we see them run among the crowds, tear their clothes, and say, Stop! Then he encouraged the crowd to reject all the false gods 
And he went on to teach them the right understanding of the one true God. Now, obviously, there's no way that I can tell you about infinite God in a 30-minute message. I can give you, however, three things about God that I pray you will remember and Southern Baptists hold very dear. First of all, I underscore from the text that Paul would insist upon us knowing today that our God is the God of creation. Man has always been interested in origins. We want to know where we and the world came from. How did we get here? And there's only two explanations to choose from. Either the world created itself or someone created it. And to think that the world created itself is preposterous. Can you think of anything else that made itself? Paul gives us the biblical truth concerning creation in this text. Look, if you will, at verse 15b, where he says to those in the crowd, Turn away from the useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. That's how Genesis begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want you to consider the word created. It comes from the Hebrew word bara, and it means to create out of nothing. I remember the days of science projects when the kids were smaller. I guess most parents have attempted the solar system. We made those different size planets out of styrofoam balls and we painted them and then we put construction paper to create the darkness and the light. But it was created out of something. But God did not do that. God did not take a styrofoam ball, fashion it, and throw it into the sky and call it the earth. He did not use construction paper and scissors to cut out a lining for the universe and call it the heavens. Instead, friend, he took nothing and created everything. Man may build something. Man may take wood and Build a house. Man may take steel and build a car. Man may take a lump of clay and fashion a vase, but only the living God can create everything out of nothing. Now, preacher, do you expect me to believe that? Friend, it's a faith assumption. It happened only once. It cannot and never will happen again. No one was there except Jehovah God to see it. So we either take his word for it or we take man's word for it. R.A. Torrey, the great preacher of old, tells us how many have accepted at face value Darwin's principal works in which the expression we may well suppose, occurs 800 times in his work as a basis for his argument. Friend, do you want to believe a man who was not there and who declares so many times, we may well suppose? I don't want to follow a man's opinion that uses that phrase so many times. By the way, God who was there doesn't use that phrase in the Bible. 
Friend, I will accept by faith the Word of God and the work of God who was there. The acceptable creation theory of many is the Big Bang theory. There was this Big Bang and the earth was made. Now folks, that's ridiculous. The Big Bangs that I've seen have never left behind the beauty and the order we find upon this earth. To my right, you see a beautiful instrument we call the piano. It's a grand piano. Let me tell you how it was created. One day there was this large elephant with great, large, ivory tusks. And he was playing a harp. And he was running through the forest. And he ran into a mahogany tree. And bang, out came that piano. <laughs> Is that not absurd? <laughs> History tells us the well-known atheist Robert Ingersoll once visited the great preacher Henry Ward Beecher. He took Ingersoll into the study. There was this magnificent contoured globe of the world complete with mountains and valleys. It was a beautiful piece of art. And Ingersoll, highly educated man, he looked at that globe and said, Beecher, that's a beautiful work of art. Who made it for you? Beecher, challenging Ingersoll's belief on creation, replied, Nobody. It just happened. Ingersoll knew better than that. And friend, listen, we know better than that. Something as complex and as majestic as our universe didn't just happen. There's a creator behind the creation. There's a designer behind the design. Think about our universe. It is uniquely fashioned and designed to meet the needs of mankind. Jehovah God knew what we needed. Jehovah God created. Jehovah God designed. That's the only explanation for it. Let me remind you that Darwin's theory of evolution is just that. It is a theory. Biblical creation is truth. After creating a period of night and day, an angel said to God, well, what are you going to do now? And God said, I guess I'll call it a day. God looked upon his creation and said, it is very good. I want you to remember about the God that you believe in. He is the God of creation. Number two. He is the God of revelation. Revelation. Look, if you will, at verse 17. Nevertheless, Paul says, he did not leave himself without witness. Folks, our God has chosen to reveal himself. He has never been without a witness. Let me share with you who and what these witnesses are. I didn't include them in the outline, but you might want to write them down. The first is nature. Again, verse 17, B. Did not leave himself without witness. In that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food. And gladness. Nature witnesses there is a God. God revealed himself in nature. Whether you look through a microscope or whether you look through a telescope, the message is the same. God is the God of power, intelligence, order, goodness. Everything bears his signature. Poet. 
Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every bush, or every common bush, a fire with God. Folks, as long as the sun shines and the rain falls down and the seasons change with predictability, God is going to have a witness in this world. In the days of the French Revolution, when anti-religious sentiment was strong, a Christian saw a man destroying an object of faith from the church. The man said, we're going to destroy everything that reminds people of God. And the man said, you can't pull down the stars. Folks, nature is a witness to the reality of God. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that man is without excuse. The first witness is nature. Now listen to me. Paul only had time to give one witness before his sermon was interrupted by an angry mob. There were those in Antioch who stoned him. Look at verse 19 and 20. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. They followed him there. Lystra, yeah, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples, those who were following Jesus, gathered around him, he rose up. Paul rose up and went in to the city. There was only one opportunity before his sermon was interrupted. It has been said that some preachers preach longhorn sermons. You know, they have a point here and a point there and a whole lot of bull between. (laughs) Not Paul. His points were clear and they were powerful. And his powerful points began to anger the crowd. John Wesley used, used to ask two questions of the men that he would send out to preach. When they got back, he would ask, was anybody converted? And secondly, did anybody get mad? If the answer was no, he would tell them that the Lord hadn't called them to preach. He'd send them back to their business. This is what he said. When the Holy Ghost convicts of sin, people are either converted or they don't like it and they get mad. Boy, the crowd got angry at Paul and his message. He wasn't able to finish. He was speaking truth and it struck a nerve and conviction fell. But let me tell you what else I believe he would have said is a witness. If he'd only had the opportunity, there is not only the witness of nature, there's the witness of conscience. God's moral law is written on our hearts. And if we will listen and be sensitive, it will tell us about God and what is right and what is wrong. Philosopher Immanuel Kant, in his book, Critique of Pure Reason, noted two things that never ceased to fill his heart with wonder. The starry heavens above me and the moral imperative within me. You see, on the outside, there's the witness of nature. On the inside, there's the witness of conscience. The conscience holds the witness of God and His moral law. But there's a third witness, and that's the Scripture. The Scripture is a clearer and greater witness The Scripture tells us of the love and the grace of God. The Scriptures tell us God's name. 
The scripture tells us God, about God's character, about his personality. I have a series of sermons on his attributes that I'll preach at some point. But we get it from the Bible. The Bible tells us about God and who he is. It is a full revelation of himself. Everything we need to know about God and man is found in his word. I read about a professional boxer who was converted to Christ. And he felt that it was wrong to continue to hit people for a living. But that was all that he knew. And so he went to the deacons of the church and asked them about it. And one of the deacons said, well, I don't see why you can't continue. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than receive. Folks, God's Word is not the book of the month. It's the book of the ages. It's God's written letter. It's God's written uh, revelation of Himself. The final great witness is Jesus Christ Himself. The greatest witness of all. Let me give you Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the expressed image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. One little girl said some people could not hear God's inside voice, and so God sent Jesus to tell them out loud. Jesus is the spitting image of God. He's God with skin on. He's God in flesh and blood. In Him you see wisdom, power, majesty, justice, mercy, grace, and the love of God. Our God, friend, is a God of revelation. He's revealed Himself through nature. He's revealed Himself through the conscience. He's revealed Himself through the Scriptures. He's revealed Himself through Jesus Christ, the greatest of all witnesses. I want you to know this about the God you believe in. Not only is He the God of creation, not only is He the God of revelation, but finally, friend, He's the God of salvation. If Paul had finished his message, to the people in Lystra. I believe he would have preached the gospel. He usually did. I believe he would have sooner or later got to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He would have declared God is the God of salvation. You know the people looked for God to come to the earth. However, they didn't know that the one true living God had already come. Folks, our God left heaven and came to where we are. And he did that through Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. When we speak of God, we speak of one God. There's only one. There's only one true living God, the God of the Bible. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But he has chosen to reveal himself in three ways to mankind, as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit. I believe that God has chosen to reveal himself in three relationships or three manifestations to better relate to us. Somebody said, all there is of God is in the Father. All that is seen of God is in the Son. And all that's felt of God is in the Holy Spirit. 
But folks, when God revealed himself as son, as Jesus Christ on the cross, he provided our salvation. Listen to Philippians 2, 7 and 8. But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. <laughs> there on the cross, Jesus was God, the God of salvation. H.L. Hunt of the last century made millions of dollars in the Texas oil business. He was an aggressive businessman with little regard for time. His chief confidant, John, could have been called in the middle of the night as easily as he could be called in the middle of the day. One night, about 2 a.m., Hunt called John and with an exciting voice, or an excited voice, declared, John! I just made the greatest trade of my life. I traded the here for the hereafter. I just got saved. Our God is the God of salvation. This is the God that we love. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we believe in. He is the God of creation. He is the God of revelation. He's the God of salvation. In the movie, Count of Monte Cristo, an elderly priest is speaking to the young convent or convict, the Count. And he's encouraging him to turn to God. And the convict replies, well, I don't believe in God. And the wise old priest responded, well, he believes in you. I want to tell you, dear friend, as I close today, your God, the God, the God of this world, believes in you enough to create you out of nothing. To create and, and take care of you and provide for you in this magnificent creation he created. He cares so much about you that he wants you to know him. And so he revealed himself and he revealed himself perfectly in his son Jesus Christ. He cares for you so much. He believes in you so much. That he came down here to where we, you are. And he died on Calvary to save you from your sins. He believes in you. Oh, shouldn't we believe in him?